Okay, uh, it gives me great pleasure to welcome Kenneth, and I'm not going to attempt your last name, <laughs> Ham. Uh, he is a graduating PhD student at University of Washington with Jeff Harris Group, and uh, he's done some fantastic tools. I don't want to steal too much thunder, but I'm, re I'm really happy to have you here today, and uh, hope uh, you all can tune in and also come in person uh, to ask questions. Thanks. It's cool. So everyone hear me okay? It's cool. Uh, <laughs> I can say my last name. <laughs> Hi, my name, my name is Ganit Ham Wong Supaswat. Uh, <laughs> today I'm going to talk about my research work on augmenting visualization tools with automated design and recommendation. So let me begin by introducing a little bit about myself. And my research interests are is at the intersection between user interface systems, uh, information visualization, and data science. And my research mission is to help people work with and benefit from data. And with this mission in mind, my PhD research focused on the design of intelligent visualization systems. So today, it's probably indisputable that visualization is critical tool uh, for data science. We have seen analysts use plots as one of the first two to look at their data, starting from looking at distribution to exploring potential relationships in their data. And even when we create machine learning model, it's important to check that the input data for the model doesn't have any data quality issues like biases and so on. Besides looking at input data and analyzing model performance, developers also use visualization like diagrams to understand and communicate complex <coughs> structure like deep learning model architectures. Since visualization is critical for data science, my research explores how can we provide automation to help people create visualization more effectively and with less efforts. And in this talk, I will show how I design visualization tools by augmenting them with automated design and recommendation. For the main part of this talk, I will show how I design formal languages for chartification and recommendation and use them to build a recommendation power interfaces for data exploration. And at the end of the talk, I will also show how I design tools that shift with TensorFlow to help developers visualize structure of deep learning models. Although these two are research projects, all of the tools that you see in this talk are open source and adopted by data science and research communities. And before I dive into the details of these two, I would like to highlight that the common challenge for all these two is to find the right balance between automation and user control. On one hand, we want to provide automation to guide users with best practices and reduce tedium in their workflow. On the other hand, we want to preserve user control to let them uh, steer the automation and have flexibility to uh, leverage their domain knowledge and intuition to achieve their goals. So let's first see how I balance between automation and user control in explicitly data analysis. So let's consider when uh, analysts receive a new data set that they haven't seen before. In an ideal exploration, a good analysts should perform two high-level tasks. First, they should begin their analysis with a broad exploration to familiarize themselves with different fields in the data set. After getting a broad overview, uh, they may focus on answering specific questions. For example, they might examine if a pair of uh, variables are correlated. Investigating these questions may spark exploration of other potentially relevant fields and in turn leading again to more focused analysis. So this is an ideal workflow that we hope analysts would do when they explore their data. However, there are few reasons that prevent analysts from achieving this goal in practice. First, many novice analysts often have what we call uh, tunnel vision. Uh, instead of having discipline to explore different aspects of the data, they may all look data quality issues like unexpected data value, like uh, some uh, input entry errors, or prematurely fixate on specific questions or hypotheses. Even for well-trained analysts, they might have limited time for some analysis projects. And since creating plots can be tedious, uh, well-trained analysts may suffer from these common pitfalls as well. So now let's see what I mean tedious by considering visualization tool for data exploration. Most of the tools typically require a certain degree of manual chart certification by a programming language like ggplot2 in R or via graphical interface like 
Tableau or Microsoft uh, Power BI. These two are very powerful for answering questions because they can create a variety of charts and answer a variety of questions. However, to provide a complete situation for a single chart, uh, analysts to have to make a number of decisions. From a data set like a car uh, collection, analysts must first select data fields or column in the data table, like horsepower and number of cylinders. To summarize the data, she may then apply data transformation, such as aggregating mean of horsepower and get grouped by the number of cylinders. And finally, to produce a chart, uh, she has to design visual encodings by selecting a mark type like bar and mapping uh, data fields to encoding channels like X and Y. And all of these tedious steps are just creating one chart in the analysis process. As a result, this tedium of specification, uh, manual specification, combining with analysts' lack of uh, either discipline or time, can impede exploration and cause analysts to overlook important insights in the data. To address this problem, uh, my research focuses on designing tools to facilitate rapid and systematic data exploration with chart recommendation. To achieve this goal, we actually have to answer a number of questions. First, how should we design interfaces that surface this chart recommendation? At the same time, how do you allow users to have control over these recommendations? Under the hood of these interfaces, how do we, do, uh, how do we build the chart recommender engine that allows users to still have control over the recommendation? And to do all of this, we need a representation of the charts themselves. In this first part of the talk, I will show you a system that I designed to answer each of these questions, starting from the Vega Live Visualization Grammar, which serves as the chart representation. Based on Vega Lite, I then build a visualization query language and recommendation engine called CompassQL. Finally, I then use CompassQL to build a series of interfaces called Voyager, which enable new form of data exploration with chart recommendation. So let's begin from the foundation of this stack of tools, uh, which is the chart representation. So to support a broad range of graphics, many popular visualization tools adopt the idea from the grammar of graphics by Lee Wilkinson. The idea is that a grammar of graphics can provide primitive building blocks to, for composing a broad range of visualizations, just like English grammar informs us how to compose uh, words into sentences. Inspired from this idea, we designed the Vega Lite grammar for representing charts in our recommendation system and for, rapid, for supporting rapid creation of interactive charts. To support these goals, Vega Lite offers chart building blocks in a concise language during inspiration from language like ggplot and the VSQL language underlying Tableau. To provide concision, Vega Lite provides sensible defaults for low level details and allow users to override these defaults to kind of customize their plots. While VSQL and GPlot, uh, uh, so while VSQL is proprietary and GPlot is tightly embedded to the R environment, Wigalite instead offers a universal JSON format and an open source JavaScript library. And by building on web-based technology, Wigalite can easily support the development of new higher level systems like chart recommendation and also support usage across multiple programming uh, languages. Beyond existing grammar like ggplot and vsql, we also uh, offer building blocks for composing multi-view and interactive charts. So let's see how Vega Lite provides building blocks for creating a chart using a histogram as an example. A histogram is essentially bar marks with x position encoding a binet field and the y position then encode a count of values within each bin. Vega Lite basically provides a JSON syntax to define and compose this structure. First, you can describe the data, in this case, from a URL, and then set graphical mark type to a bar. We can then uh, define encoding or mapping between data fields and visual properties like X and Y. Here, temperature is mapped to X. We can also define data transformation like binning within the encoding. And finally, map aggregated count to y-axis. Now we get a representation that reveals underlying structure of a histogram. Later in this talk, 
I will show that this kind of representation also enable us to reason about and rank uh, recommendations uh, for shards too. Note that this code for histogram is kind of uh, concise because under the hood, Vegalite automatically generates sensible defaults for low level details like adding linear scale for the quantitative uh, view and adding axis automatically for both X and Y encoding. With these grammar based building blocks, we can also add more encodings to the chart. For instance, we can encode the weather type with color and we get a stack histogram. Here, Wigalite automatically uses a categorical color palette to encode weather type since it's a nominal view uh, instead of using color ramp, which is better for a quantitative view. But you. How is that specifying grouping? You're grouping by the weather, sun, snow, rain, fog. Yeah, so that's uh, inferred <coughs> from, from the certification. So basically, uh, because we have. So, so part of this is like specifying both the. Uh, in, encoding. Another part is that part of the discussion also specify data query. So when you have three fields, it's kind of like you have you in, in SQL you do select uh, count. That means you have aggregation. And then whenever something is not aggregated in 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 the a SQL query, then the other things are things that you group by. So so, it's so, group by. so we can infer oh, the SQL group query by. from this case. Okay. Yeah, and even though we provide default color, you still can still customize the color by overriding default scale properties. For example, we can make sunny weather yellow. With this kind of concise syntax, we can create and recommend a variety of charts. And we also extend Vegalai beyond existing grammar with an algebra for composing multi-view graphics using operators like repeat for like uh, creating scatterplot matrix, uh, concatenation and layering, and, and also faceting for creating small multiples. And we also present uh, building blocks for specifying interactions on these composed views. And with, within Vegalai, all of these building blocks are available in a single unified language. In this talk, though, I'm going to focus more on uh, the applications of Vegalite, especially on chart recommendation. So I wouldn't cover detail uh, about our syntax for view composition and interactions. But if you want to learn more about them, feel free to look at our public talk, uh, which is available on YouTube on our website and research paper. I believe that uh, the talk that we, a version of this talk that we, we gave here is also recorded in, in Microsoft uh, uh, online uh, platform, too. So in terms of applications, let's first talk about open source usage of Vega Lite. As you can see from the example, you can write Vega Lite code to quickly create charts. And to aid our users, we also provide online editor that helps validate and auto-complete syntax. Uh, so users don't have to remember all, everything in the syntax. And in terms of usage pattern, we have seen people use Vegalite in publications. For example, a recent book by Nat Daniel Fisher here and, and Maria Meyer comes with an online gallery of Vegalite examples. Leading academic journal like Nature also mentioned that tools like Vegalite also make scientific data more accessible and reproducible. With the JSON syntax, Vegalite can also serve as a visualization file format. We are very excited uh, that uh, Jupyter Lab, which is the next version of the Jupyter Data Science Notebook, already ships with native support for Vegalite. And although our main library is in JavaScript, our collaborators have developed native APIs to wrap Vegalite in other languages. For example, Altair is a popular Python wrapper for Vegalite, and the feedback from the uh, Python community is very encouraging. For example, a review by Dan Saber say that it's this type of one-to-one-to-one -one -one mapping between thinking, code, and visualization. That's my favorite thing about Altair. And we see Vegalite being used in many leading companies. Uh, and for this month alone, uh, it's downloaded over 80,000 times on NPM and it's growing. And we also receive over 1,000 times on GitHub. And in fact, the Altair wrapper actually received more stuff than <laughs> Vegalite, uh, in part because Python data science community is, is larger. We, we are really excited about this uh, adoption and usage in industry. And besides supporting manual chart creation, like you see, uh, Vegalite can support chart recommendation too. 
So let's see how we do that in the compact SQL visualization query uh, language and engine. So I mentioned earlier that manual chart creation can be tedious. And that's in part due to the fact that you still have to provide complete specification of mark type, encoding, and transformations. To reduce the tedium, one idea is to instead let user provide only a part of the specification. And this is the key idea in Compass SQL. Uh, basically, we use partial regularization as a way to describe a recommendation query. This way, we can reduce the need to provide complete specification while still giving fine-grained control for users over their recommendation. So to see how Compass SQL works, let's see a basic query that tries to do automatic mark selection similar to a feature in Tableau. So let's first begin with a complete regularization, which describes a single chart. Note that here I show regular in a table format to save space. Now, uh, if we want a partial specification that asks the engine to determine a mark, we can use a wildcard to omit mark. And given a wildcard, the compassionate engine then enumerates candidate charts by replacing the wildcards with all possible marks. Um, however, just simply enumerating all mark types may produce charts that violate basic design principles. Uh, for example, origin in this plot is a categorical field. If you use line or area to encode category that doesn't have order, you might suggest trend that doesn't really exist in the data. So that's misleading. Thus, the compatible engine also includes built-in design constraint to prune misleading encodings. After pruning, we still have multiple qualifying charts. The second part of the query is the recommendation method, which is for organizing the results of recommendation by grouping and ranking the qualifying charts. In this case, to choose one best chart, we can tell the engine to choose the best chart based on a perceptual effectiveness ranking, which we derive from prior work on graphical perception. And since in this location, the only wild heart is the mark, the ranking then consider effectiveness of mark type uh, based on the type of fields on X and Y visual channels. And since bar is a better choice for in encoding quantitative and categorical fields than point, Compass QL will choose the bar chart as the top recommendation in this case. With this query, we can replicate Tableau's uh, automatic mark feature, which is kind of cool. However, while automatic mark can uh, save uh, time for users for one step, one limitation is that users still have to select data fields that they want to visualize. And moreover, the goal of Compass UL is enable new query, not just replicating existing features. So let's see a more advanced query that enumerates both data and visual encodings. So suppose we want to see pairwise relationships between all quantitative fields of a given data set. We can make a query with two encoding mappings and make every property from mark, uh, visual channels, and fields, all of them wildcards. But then we can constrain the fields to be just quantitative fields. And seeing these many wildcards, you might say, whoa, wouldn't this create so many charts? Well, the answer is yes, of course. But that's why we need to provide recommendation method. And in this case, uh, we're going to provide a method to group redundant charts. And since we want to see plots showing different pair of fields, we will group the charts by the data fields that they show. And we see some more structured grouping here, right? But still a lot of charts within each group. Another step is to choose the most perceptually effective chart in each group. And then we get a scatter plot for each uh, pair of quantitative fields. To choose a, a scatter plot, the ranking considers both the effectiveness of mark type and the encoding mappings. For the mark, PI is best for encoding pairs of quantitative fields, so we use point. For the encoding mappings, we use prior knowledge from graphical perception that people can decode quantitative values from position encoding better than length, and length is in turn better than angle and area and, and so on. With this kind of knowledge, we can rank the effectiveness of the encodings. 
In this case, we have two quantitative fields. So Compassive L will use X and Y position as they are the most effective encodings. And as a result, then we can get this gallery of, of scatter plot that show all pairs of quantitative fields. As you see uh, in the next section, this is actually a query that user can specify via a graphical interface. So with this kind of compassive L queries, uh, I then use iterative design process to develop a series of systems called Voyager. In this talk, I will only briefly show the original Voyager and its user study that motivated us to develop Voyager 2. And I will then show the Voyager 2 system in detail, including how we use CompassQL to enable new interaction methods in the system. As I mentioned earlier, that one motivation for doing all this stack of tools is that manual chart creation can impede exploration. So let's see how we design new interaction methods that apply chart recommendation to facilitate more rapid and systematic exploration. To consider another interaction model as an alternative to manual chart specification, we draw some inspirations from exploratory search systems. For example, I like to watch a movie on Netflix on weekends, but I often don't know which movie to watch. Netflix interfaces provide a few mechanisms to help me find a movie. <coughs> First, I can browse around to see the collection of movies that are available and recommended by the system. Second, if I want to see a category uh, movie uh, like comedy, I can study the recommendation by using a facet navigation to filter movies by its category. Finally, I can also pick a movie that I liked before to get related suggestions. Inspired from this kind of browser interfaces, we developed the Voyager Visualization Browser with the goal to help users systematically explore more data and avoid pre-major fixation. Voyager provides user control by letting users select data fields to steer their recommendations. Given a user selection, Voyager then suggests plots uh, showing transformation of the data from raw data to aggregated data. And it also shows plots suggesting one extra field to help user discover other potentially relevant factors. As we want to consider recommendation browsing as an alternative to manual classification, we compare Voyager with a manual classification tool in a user study on exploratory data analysis. For the baseline condition, we developed Polestar, which is an interface model on Tableau. Uh, with this interface, users can create charts by dragging fields uh, to the encoding shelf to find visual encodings. And the reason that we have to develop this tool is to make sure that the only difference with condition is the interaction method. But all plots that can be shown in Voyager can be similarly created in Polestar. For study results, I first uh, analyzed interaction logs to see if Voyager meets our goal to help users systematically explore more data. So I found that a user interacts with 1.4 times more unique field sets in Voyager, confirming that Voyager helps users explore more data. Another part of this analysis is that exploratory analysis involves both open exploration and question answering. So we also ask users to rate their two preference for both tasks. Uh, for open exploration, users prefer Voyager as browsing is less tedious and help them discover insight that they might otherwise overlook. However, they prefer Polestar for question answering because they have more control to create specific charts that they want. Qualitative feedback from our participants also reflect the complementary nature of Voyager and Polestar. When users say that I would start with Voyager, but want to go and switch to Polestar to dive into my questions. But once that question was answered, I would like to switch back to Voyager. Overall, this study results show that these two interaction models have two uh, complementary values for supporting open exploration and question answering. As exploratory analysis involves both tasks, this result also call for a unified tool that provides better balance between automatic recommendation and manual certification. And of course, this motivates us to develop Voyager 2, which is a tool that blends certification and recommendation in a single tool. 
To facilitate bot exploration and question answering, Voyager 2 provides multiple interaction methods uh, with varying degree of automation. We build Voyager 2 directly on Polestar, uh, so users can create arbitrary views via the drag and drop interfaces. Moreover, we add two new partial specification interfaces. Based on the main specified view, Voyager 2 shows related views to help the uh, user discover relevant data fields and alternative ways to summarize or encode the data. Moreover, to give user control over the automation, Voyager 2 lets user directly alter wildcards to create multiple charts in parallel. So let's see how these three instructions work in a demo. In this demo, we'll use Voyager 2 to explore a data set about cars. I will also highlight how Voyager 2 produces underlying uh, compass QR queries as well. Upon loading the data set, Voyager 2 lists all the data fields on the left. The middle pane shows encoding shelf that user can drop field to specify visual encoding, similar to, to like Tableau. The main view on the right shows the specified view on the top. As user haven't specified any visual encoding, this view is initially empty. Below the specified view is the related view section. Voyager 2 initially show univariate summaries to help analysts begin by examining all fields without the need to create all, any of this view manually. Looking at the top left plot, we can see that most cars in this dataset have even number of cylinders. We can look at line chart and see that this dataset is kind of old, actually older than me. It's, it's from all the 70s. <laughs> uh, after exploring each field in the dataset, the analyst may want to explore by variate relationships between different pair of fields. Of course, the analyst can manually drag and drop different pair of fields to the encoding shelf, but repeatedly doing this can be tedious and require the analyst to have discipline to uh, examine all interesting pair of fields. Instead, we should to provide wildcards for creating multiple charts in parallel. Below the list of fields on the left are the wildcard fields, which can be used to encode multiple data fields. To let the system pick appropriate encoding mappings, you could, user can drop any data fields or wildcard fields onto the wildcard shelf. For example, dropping two quantitative field wildcards to the wildcard shelf produces a gallery of scatter plots between all pairs of quantitative fields. Under the hood, the wildcards in the UI directly maps to the wildcard in the compass CL query that I have shown earlier in this talk. With this gallery, users can easily explore relationships between all pairs of quantitative fields. For example, we can see that horsepower and miles per gallon appear to have a quadratic relationship. Basically, cars with higher horsepower tends to have lower uh, miles per gallon. To see what's the outlier point, we can also hold it to see the tooltip. And using the bookmark button, we can also take some notes about insights during exploration as well. To further drive recommendation based on this view, we can use the focus button to promote this view to be the main view. Clicking the focus button updates both the encoding shelf and the specified view on the top. Based on this specified view, Voyager 2 recommends different kinds of related views. The related summary section suggests alternative ways to summarize the same data. For example, from the scatter plot above, we can see a 2D histogram of the same two fields. Under the hood, Voyager 2 generates related views by inferring a query from the specification of the main view. To generate related summaries, uh, Voyager 2 adds wildcards to transformation functions and to marks to show different ways to summarize the data. Voyager 2 also uses this kind of similar query inferencing technique to generate other kind of related fields as well. Sco uh, scrolling down more, we can see the field suggestion sections, which add one additional field to the specified view to promote discovery of relationship that uh, we might otherwise overlook. From the demo, we have seen how user can use and transition between all these different interaction methods to perform data exploration. So let's see how we evaluate Voyager 2. Can I ask a question first? Uh, 
Um, it seems like one of the common things to do is um, transformations. Like maybe you want to log transformation on something, or maybe you want um, power to weight ratio is a, a thing you would want, a column that you would want, and it's easily derived from yeah. two of the fields. And I don't see that in there. Is it there? And you just didn't talk about it. Uh, so. So that, uh, we didn't implement that, but we can add it as a part of the Compass QL framework. Is that, but, is that a thing that you could do this same kind of suggestion yeah. approach with? Yeah, so basically, if you analyze static of the data and know that uh, it has some like, power relationship, then you can apply log. So you can definitely use this kind of techniques and then surface them in the, the interface, like Voyager 2. So let's see how uh, we evaluate Voyager 2. Again, we conduct a user study on exploratory analysis and compare Voyager 2 with Polestar. This study design allows us to directly contrast the effect of new partial specification interfaces over pure manual specification like Polestar, which is basically the standard tool that we use this day. So similar to the prior study, we analyzed if Voyager 2 promotes data coverage and found that users interact with 2.4 more unit field sets in Voyager 2. We also analyze uh, user ratings for each task. For open exploration, users prefer Voyager 2 over Polestar, like the previous study. However, for question answering, users rate Voyager 2 as comparable to Polestar. And since users favor Polestar over the original Voyager, here you can see that Voyager 2 improved over Voyager in this aspect. And overall, in terms of supporting both tasks, Voyager 2 improved over both Polestar and original Voyager. And despite having more features than Polestar, many participants also expressed that Voyager 2 is actually easier to use. One said that, I like that uh, Voyager 2 show me which field to include in order to make a specific graph. With Polestar, I had to do a lot of trial and error and couldn't express what I wanted to see. Another says that I feel more confident using Voyager 2. Uh, it helped me to learn. To summarize, Voyager 2 presents a set of interfaces that bring chart specification and chart recommendation in a single tool. And overall, the study shows that Voyager 2 can facilitate both exploration and question answering better than existing uh, tools that we compare. Do you happen to compare Voyager 2 to Voyager 1? Uh, we didn't do that. But we, do use, we designed a study in, in a similar way so we can compare with previous results. Uh, and one of the reasons is that uh, Voyager, two, Voyager 1 is good in one aspect, but, but, also, but, but, but for, for question answering, it's not proven. While for Polestar, it's an interaction model that's like widely used in the industry. So it's proven that like, if you do as good as Polestar for, for uh, manual specification, then it's it's, it's definitely not bad, right? And then you can improve over for, for open exploration, then you can, you can see that we improve for both aspects. I hear that. I, the counter is, you said Voyager 2 is better than Voyager. It's surprising not to like put the two side by side and have people go, oh, wow, this one's so much better because you gave me extra buttons. Or conversely, oh, no, these extra buttons are really heavy, giving me a panic attack now that I've had a chance to see this. I preferred it with fewer buttons. Uh, I, yeah. So when we, when we design Voyager 2, we actually feel like this is becoming more powerful tool than Voyager. But uh, surprisingly, like user actually say it's easier to use. So, uh, so it turns out not that bad as we worry at the beginning. Um, yeah, question. One of the challenges that I have with doing exploratory data analysis is that I often see things in the graph that aren't real that are, let's say, not statistically significant if you were comparing bars against another. Is, is there, like, is that a field of study in, in the InfoViz to, like, not just support open-ended exploration, but also to filter based on, like, what's, what's a real difference versus what you can show at all? Yeah, that's something that's definitely we have to consider when we work on this kind of interfaces. For example, in, in the demo that we have, we only show, like, summary, like, by mean, but Actually, mean is not, not always trustworthy, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes you want to see variance. So one of the things that we can do in two is like trying to uh, provide recommendation for visualization that also shows uncertainty, like if we want to show error bar or those kind of things. But they also challenge them of like, if we add those more sophisticated encoding, how do we explain for users, especially for novice, to make them 
uh, understand the encoding that we add to as well. So that's definitely a, a challenge that we need to do going forward. It, it seems like uh, you're allowing people to um, explore a lot of pairs of, of variables, and that's nice. Except, I don't know, you know, we're chatting about that thing. It's like you're doing multiple hypothesis testing in um, in this very bottom-up way and allowing people to, uh, as Andy was saying, come to things that look like conclusions, um, yeah. but maybe aren't, or just just look like conclusions because they're, they're noise. And while I appreciate the ability to explore this, this space of, uh, I'm, I'm fearful of it. And going back to your second slide of how people approach this problem, that you com completely didn't talk about people approaching data analysis problems by having hypothesis going in that they want to verify and having a top-down process to complement this bottom-up process. Can you talk about this kind of stuff? Yeah, definitely. So, so when so that that like definitely some uh, potentially harm if people use this kind of tool in the wrong way. Uh, because if you, if we talk about exploratory analysis, like uh, pioneers like Tukey, actually when he defined it, he says that well, you should distinguish between when you have just some. Uh, subset of data to do exploration, and this is to make sure that well, even if we have hypothesis, are you sure that your data like are collected in the right way? Does it have the right distribution? And this kind of tool is actually more aiming at make sure that well, you don't just go into hypothesis testing without looking if your data actually representative or have any bias or even have like bug or errors like like we have seen data set like that use like uh, like for example like variable like age we have seen data set like use uh, 99 as like now right so to so make sure that those kind of thing doesn't uh, interfere with analysis but then if you want to do conformatory analysis then it's you uh, Ideally, you should split the, the, the test between the two, but definitely there's a harm where uh, novice analysts that doesn't do this practice right, then yes, we can uh, pay, play a part in doing that too. But that's not something that this kind of tool do because like tools like Gplot or, or Tableau already play a part in that program already. So maybe one way is, a part of it is like educating people to do the right thing. So that's what I would say. Okay. It just, you're giving, Novices, sharp knives. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They're going to cut themselves yeah. or others. Yeah, that, that's, that's very true for all the tools we, we've seen, right? For example, yeah. uh, I talked to my boss, Doc, and, and he, who created D3, which is a very popular visualization tool. And he's so proud that he enabled a lot of, uh, like, so many sophisticated visualizations that we see on the web this day. At the same time, he say that one of the deep skills that he has is like he enables so many people to create chat chunks on the internet. So obviously when we offer to there are like trade-off. Yeah. It's unclear that the right answer to um, I make a lot of, uh, do you make a lot of sharp knives is other people make a lot of sharp knives too mm. though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so it can provide some way to, to guide people to do uh, things right in the tool, uh, that's kind of nice. Like in a way, like we talking about tools like Tableau, oftentimes people use it to jump into questions without all, looking at other things. What we try to do here is try to provide guide that you should look at other things, but then there's another level of guidance like we have to, to do like to make sure that, hey, but don't use this as a way to confirm your hypothesis. Right. So, when I was talking to Jeff about this last week, he was saying that in the old days, this was about hypothesis formation. Mm -hmm. And then there was a latter stage where you look at the rest of the data or mm -hmm. you design a, a study after the fact to validate that hypothesis. But again, people don't seem to be following that so much these days. We jump to conclusions? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or just ignore the data. Yeah. yeah. So taking a step back to see a bigger picture here, so I have contributed foundation for chart recommendation, including the regular uh, grammar for representing charts, and the CompassQL recommendation engine and query language. And based on these foundations, I have built the Voyager and Voyager 2 interfaces to enable new form of visual data exploration with chart recommendation. Besides supporting data exploration, this system have also served as foundation for new applications and research projects. 
Earlier, we have seen Vegalight being used in data science via JupyterLab and a wrapper like Altair in Python. In an ongoing work, we are collaborating with the Jupyter team to integrate Voyager 2 as an extension for Jupyter Lab, so we can help users easily transition between data exploration and other analysis activities in a single environment. Besides industry application, each of these two also enable new research projects. Uh, for example, we have built a model for automated reasoning about visualization similarity and sequencing on top of Vega Light. Our colleagues at Georgia Tech and Stanford are working on different natural language interfaces for data visualization and analysis based on Vega Light as well. CompassQL is also used to generate training data for a system that reverse engineer visual encodings from bitmap chart images. Uh, Voyager has also been excited to study other issues in data analysis. For example, uh, my colleague at UW, Yosu Kim, come here to MSR over the summer and actually extend Voyager to, uh, with many people here, to study freeform annotation in, in data exploration. So far in the first part of the talk, I've shown the platform and interfaces that allow us to balance between automation and user control for data exploration and even support some new applications. In the second part of the talk, I will now show how I combine automatic layout algorithm with user input to visualize with data flow graph of deep learning model in TensorFlow. So back a few years ago, uh, Google released the TensorFlow open source library to make it easier to implement and deploy deep learning models. And TensorFlow is basically a set of high-level APIs that users can use to generate low-level data flow graph. And this kind of low-level data flow graph uh, has many benefits in terms of uh, model implementation and deployment. However, uh, when developer works with the code, trying to understand the network architecture from the code can be challenging. In practice, developers often use diagrams to help them understand and share high-level structure of their models. Uh, whenever there's a new paper about a new novel model, we will see a diagram explaining the model architecture. At work, developers also draw diagrams as a way to understand exin uh, sorry, existing code base or help explain their models to other developers. Since diagrams are critical to their work, developers desire it to, to draw this diagram automatically. Of course, before building any tool, the first thing to try is to use standard graph layout like GraphWiz to visualize the graph. However, TensorFlow Graph contains thousands of low-level operations. Thus, the uh, output layout looks pretty complex. You cannot even see the ellipses for the node here. And uh, this is actually a hello world example, but it looks way more complicated than uh, advanced di uh, network diagram that we saw earlier. To design a visualization tool that match developers' need, then we work closely with deep learning uh, researchers and developers at Google to understand the difference between the TensorFlow graph and the diagrams that they normally draw. First, uh, TensorFlow graph contains low-level operation without any explicit groupings. Meanwhile, the expert diagrams show high-level structures between layers or a group of operations. Moreover, the TensorFlow graph are cluttered because there are some high-degree nodes that are not even important, like locking. And because when you lock data, you connect to all layers in the graph. That's why it caused this spaghetti havoc. Uh, in contrast, the expert diagram don't even include these bookkeeping operations at all. Based on these insights, we create the TensorFlow graph visualizer to convert this low-level data graph into diagrams that show high-level structures, like the diagram that experts draw. And we use two strategies to produce uh, this high-level diagram. First, we apply techniques from the visualization community, like building a hierarchical cluster graph, so we can show high-level overview, and let user expand the graph to see its internal structure. The typical part for this technique, though, is how to provide node clustering that match user's mental map. And since it's actually impossible to infer that from the graph topology alone, 
We, here we balance between automation and user control by letting users specify uh, name hierarchies in, in their source code. And the second strategy is to accept unimportant nodes to declutter the graph. So we design a, a set of heuristics to extract high degree unimportant nodes, but then still give user control to customize the extraction. So let's see how the tool works by trying to explore and understand the difference between layers in a convolution network for image classification. Here we see the interface. So the graph visualizer is released as a part of TensorFlow, <coughs> which is the official visualization tool that shifted TensorFlow. And here is a graph tab. And the visualization shows the graph in two parts. The main graph on the left shows the model's core flow. Meanwhile, the right part of the graph show unimportant nodes that are extracted to declutter the graph. Uh, so let's zoom into the main graph. Uh, we can see uh, many re rounded rectangles, which represent groups of operations that perform certain functions, like convolution layers uh, and fully, uh, fully connected layers. Meanwhile, smaller ellipses represent individual operations. We can see that the two convolution layers here have the same color. This means that uh, they have identical internal structure, so you still don't have to explore all of them manually, so you can see the, the similarity. We can expand the, one of the layer by double-clicking and expanding it. Uh, here we can see that the module has a 2D convolution operation to combine input data with weights. And the output from this operation is then added by bias variable and then passed to uh, the rectified linear unit, which is an activation function. If we go up and expand one of the fully connected layer instead, uh, we're going to see similar weights and bias variable inside. However, here the weights are applied using a matrix multiplication instead of a convolution operation. And this is the difference between fully connected layer and uh, convolution layer. Using this kind of hierarchical graph, we can see high level structure of the model, but still have the ability to dive in and explore details on demand. One question that you might have though is like, do we really have to extract unimportant nodes to the site? And here's a visual evidence that we do, because if you don't, well, all these high degree unimportant nodes like error reporting, calculating gradients, make the layout look like a spaghetti hairball. And by extracting them to the site, then we get a nice diagram that shows the core flow of the model. But users can still add things back to the main graph if, if they want. Uh, I'm, I'm not gonna show that in this talk though. Um, so we, we, we released the tool as a part of TensorFlow and after the release, uh, we have seen some key usage uh, patterns. <coughs> the most common usage pattern is to inspect models. For example, one of the users used the tool to verify if the code produced what we intended. Another used the tool to find a name of a node so that they can do further exploration, like using other part of TensorBot to see evolution of a particular input. People also use screenshots from our tool to explain their models, like in TensorFlow's official tutorial, in third-party articles, and when people ask questions on Stack Overflow. Many blog and video tutorials also suggest a best practice for developers to iteratively rename their nodes until their visualizations match their mental model, especially when they share their model with other colleagues. While we know that developers normally don't like to change their code, the fact that they are willing to do it to get better visualization clearly shows the value that they can get from this kind of visualization. And finally, a common public feedback is that model visualization is a key feature of TensorFlow. Like a common on query says that almost all open, uh, open source machine learning packages lack the ability to visualize the model and follow the computation pipeline. Another blog post says that Visualization is fundamental to the creative process and our ability to develop better models. So visualization tools like TensorBoard are a great step into the right direction. To summarize, in this talk I have shown you how I add automation to visualization tools in critical domain including data exploration and understanding deep learning model in TensorFlow. As I mentioned earlier, the main challenge for adding automation for this tool is to balance between automation and user control. So let's revisit how we balance this, uh, achieve this balance in each system. For Vega Lite, 
we generate sensible defaults for details that analysts normally wouldn't care about. But when they do, we let them override these defaults. For Voyager and Compassity well, we embed expert design and analysis knowledge in the form of constraints, rankings, and recommendation types. But we still let users steal recommendations by providing partial certification. In TensorFlow Graph, we optimally apply layout technique like hierarchical graph clustering, but still let user control over the hierarchy by specifying name hierarchy in their source code. Going forward, uh, I would like to continue my research mission to help people work with and benefit from data with the design of visualization and intelligent systems. One area I'm excited is to develop new application of visualization recommendation based on the platform that we have built. Uh, and some of these applications will drive further research question in, in visualization and recommendation as well. For example, imagine if you can specify information that you want on, to show up on the dashboard and the two automatically design an interactive dashboard for you. To support this system, we need to num work on a number of challenges. First, what should be the query interface and language for satisfying user intent? Moreover, in visualization research, we have been mostly focusing on the effectiveness of, of single shard and other techniques. But to suggest a dashboard, we also have to study uh, and design new constraints between multiple views, such as consistency between visual encodings in the sub-views of a dashboard. And finally, as we go from single static chart to an interactive dashboard, the space of possible design grow exponentially. How might we design a ranking that can cover all of this design space? Uh, in Compassive L, we kind of like pre-train the model and have the ranking up front. But uh, to scale in this, into this space, I would like to explore a probabilistic model that can learn over time so we can learn from user interaction instead of having to develop the whole model up front. Um, another research area that I'm excited to work on is building interactive tools to support the development and understanding of machine learning systems. Tools like graph visualization in TensorFlow has lowered the difficulty to alter and understand the structure of the model. However, you still, you still have to rely on textual code to alter visual concepts like neural networks. One direct extension from this work would be allowing developers to alter networks by directly manipulating the visualization. Besides easing creation, we should also ensure that people understand this system too, especially we are relying more and more on machine learning systems. For example, we have seen a bad instance that machine learning has been used to predict future criminals. But it turns out that the model is biased against African Americans because the training data that we put into the system is biased. Uh, this is an important reminder that the quality of the model largely depends on the data that we feed into the system. Basically, garbage in, garbage out. To prevent this kind of biases, the world needs better tools to inspect the training data. An even bigger question is how can we help people analyze and understand model behavior? And this is not just a problem for machine learning developers. Oftentimes, other stakeholders in product development like product manager and designer, also, or even customers, want to understand behavior of the model as well. How might we design the tool to support the need of these uh, stakeholders in the development process? To achieve this goal, uh, I don't think it's something that I can answer alone, but I hope to collaborate closely with uh, other people in HCI and also machine learning experts and also other stakeholders to understand their needs and, and best practice. So we can design tools to support their needs and enhance this tool with automation to aid experts and also guide novices. Again, to add automation to this tool, we have to find the right balance between automation and user control. Lastly, I would like to say that I think research is team sport and collaboration is key to make a uh, big impact, making big impact. Like I couldn't have done all of this work alone, uh, so I would like to thank my mentors and colleagues at UDRAP, uh, Tableau, and Google, especially to my uh, advisor Jeff, and to my lab mates Dom and Arvin, who co author a lot of system you see in this talk, uh, especially on the uh, visualization for exploratory analysis site. And also thank my co authors of the TensorFlow Graph visualization project at Google. 
And lastly, I'm also grateful that I get a chance to mentor a number of talented undergrad research assistants over the year and work with many wonderful collaborators in the open source community. And with that, I'm happy to take more questions. Because this is not my main field, this yeah, sure. specialization. But I see you try to do the recommendation system from the big chunk of data, which is too much to go through. Right? Mm -hmm. And eventually, you found that hey, recommendation is maybe it's too hard. That's why you have some button in the Voyager version two, so that user can dig deeper into whatever they want. And you, you want to improve your recommendation system. Eventually, maybe that will give you, I mean, reduce time to click the button, right? Mm -hmm. But it looks like what you are heading in the end, you want something like personalization that user don't have to click anything at all. Uh, so I don't think we're going to get into the direction that user don't have to click anything at all because uh, in analysis, what's the goal of the tool? The tool is to support people to leverage their domain knowledge and intuition, which is hard to perfectly put that in the tool. <coughs> but in terms of having personalization, like uh, that, that's... That's a part where we can make the interaction between automated agent and, and user to collaborate more tightly. So that, that's, that's what we want to add. But it's not like we want to make our analysis automated. That's definitely something, at least in the near future, that, that users uh, still have, have more flexibility than AI system in terms of contributing to the analysis goal. So, so that's the part that I'm actually curious about. So let's say you saw the same problem over and over. Like, I want to know what should I order next for my company or whatsoever. If you saw this a million times, you saw data from a million companies, maybe eventually you can derive some deep reinforcement learning system that can answer this specific question, right? Uh, so yes, if we get really broad set of data to analyze, uh, in ideal, situation, we may get there. But the thing is, this is very exploratory ta task. Like, every single data set has different aspects that you have to explore. Uh, even the same data set you give to different analysts, they're going to use slightly different exploration, depends on their uh, interest or prior domain knowledge. So, so before we get there, I think uh, you have to provide some way for user to control the system too. Uh, even if, if in, in other kind of application, like talking about uh, self-driving car, right? Obviously, we won't want to drive too much, but you still want to give some control so that if that's something that's going to happen, suppose like self-driving car cause a uh, traffic jam, like is it the companies that build the cars fall or like the one that's own the cars fall? If it's still the latter, you still still have some con want to have some control over automation. So like, I think. Like broadly, not just visualization too, when we design automated system, you still want some degree of automation in order to, to, uh, to facilitate use, real usage. All right, makes sense. You answered a few questions earlier about some future directions to go with Voyager might be uh, recommendations for data transformations or guidance about uncertainty. So let's say you, you build a hypothetical system called Voyager 3. Uh, <laughs> at that point, how would you evaluate it? Is it still, does it still make sense at that point to do another head-to-head -head com comparison against Polestar or Voyager 2? Or at what point do you choose another method for evaluating these tools? Yeah, so I think at that point, I think we have to focus more on specific aspects that we are improving, right? Because like right now, we don't have, as we know, like learning user study is, is, is time consuming. Uh, right now, we want to establish that this is the direction that's like, can be promising, but we don't have uh, a chance to find you. Like, like even for example, we show like transformation and then adding one more field. There can be other type of recommendation, like showing more uncertainty or when people uh, add too many uh, data field to the visualization, we want them to step back too. So trying to optimize how should we do provide recommendation would be something that you have to do more like local search within the system. But right now it's like comparing to broad aspect like this is totally different interaction method. That's why we compare with Postal. Going forward, definitely we have to do different studies. So would it be like a deployment study? Like a, with now with this integration in Jupyter, do you have the potential now to track usage and see what usage patterns are? Or is that a direction that you're going to go in? So, so there are trade-offs there because like we, 
So right now we some we have the uh, infrastructure for tracking user interaction when we run user study, but it's not like we're going to be able to deploy that without invading users' privacy. Maybe, uh, but we can do a more compromising method, which is like if we partner with some group that's going to use those, then we can turn that on for those groups because we already get permission from them. But we, it's not something that we can just deploy in a while without uh, invading that privacy. Building perhaps on his question, uh, can I ask you to jump back to the Voyager 2 slides? Uh, sure. Uh, Sorry about that. And specifically the Voyager 2 uh, example. Voyager 2 example, like demo? Voyager 2 uh, demo, yeah. Sure. OK. Oh, lovely. Uh, great. And if you jump forward about three slides, Going. What I want to see is like the variations on the bivariate view. Oh, I see. Um, so there I... you go. Keep going. Next one is when you start showing your recommendations for when after you've selected this. Yeah. And it starts showing uh, next one. There we go. Yeah. Uh, of the related views below, which of them do you feel are good examples of best practice that give the user additional information about the visualization, which are presumably what you're trying to do? For example, do you believe that the thing on the bottom left here, the uh, heat map, you know, is what the user was looking for? Is what the user was looking to learn when they said, "I want more information about that thing up there"? Yeah. So, so it's different kind of relay view kind of serve slightly different purpose. For example, summary. We know that like if you have to do that in prosa, it's kind of tedious. So actually, in the user study, even though it's like a thirty minute session, we see that a lot of participants at the end they kind of use this as like a shortcut. Uh, to, to like go to the summary view because they want to create this view, but to do this you have to click bin two two times up there, and then you have to do count. And not not everybody can think that fast to do it, right? So in some way, summary is like in part providing a shortcut, and in some cases, depending on the data, if your data has so many data points and it's kind of cluttered, it's hard to see where is the real mean or median, right? So so the summary is sort of like providing a shortcut. Well. Uh, if you go down to uh, few suggestion, that's where it's kind of like uh, we want to provide a way for them to quickly skim through if there are something that. Okay, that bottom left is again a great example. Scatter plot with variable size circles. Which perception study told you this was a good idea? Uh, so, so, so I think that's that's where I come to the to the uh, question of. Of map that, uh, so uh, some of how to best provide this recommendation. That's a still an area that we have to further optimize from these two. Uh, so there are some cases where you really want to use this, but maybe we should not always show this. That's right. But maybe there are some cases where this is useful, and we have to determine like the threshold when is this useful. Right now, this is more like a template that well, if I want to add categorical for you, uh, then Color is the best. If you want to add more, one more quantitative field, then size is the best option we use here. Obviously, this terminology uh, will break when you have start having more field, and we actually try to have some cutoff. Like for example, if you choose that plot with three quantitative field, we no longer would have a pain for adding the fourth quantitative field because it doesn't make sense anymore. This one is kind of like at the boundary that yes, I agree with you. A lot of time it's probably not useful, but when it does. Well, it's not beyond the boundary that is useful anymore. But you might also notice that that's a reason why we put categorical above quantitative field here, because that one uh, seems more generally useful. This one is like at the boundary. At least in this case, would you generate a binned acceleration and coloring it by that as a sort of way of converting that quantitative field into a categorical view of that? Is there any sort of system for doing that in there? Right now, we don't do that because we try to do uh, one one set of change, like one type <coughs> of change. In a way, if you think about uh, space of visualization design, where you have a node, a single visualization, we want to right now we recommend neighbors of those nodes. Right. We don't want to jump too many steps. Otherwise, like people like, how do we get from current stage to those stage? But those are neighbors in yeah. the Vega light description space, not necessarily in a user conception space. That is to say, adding acceleration versus adding bend acceleration aren't, to me as a user, I'll, right, 
adding acceleration is a dot size versus spin acceleration is a power size. Uh, that's true. So th I think then that that that's hard we'll actually. This later. <laughs> yeah. Do you think that the Voyager exploration data process applies equally well to other types of data? Like this is tabular data with quantitative and categorical attributes, but does it apply equally well to say if you have network data, graph data, text data, other forms? So, so the, the I think the idea of having partialification that you can guide the recommendation by some metrics, I think that idea is generally applicable for other type of. Uh, analysis. But then if you have graph data, there might be a certain type of operation that you would like to do that's totally different from adding mean and sum in, in tabular data. So those kind of part is it's gonna change when you design for those other type of data. Well if there are no more questions, let's thank him again.